Many people ask me where I get my ideas from. Um, I think I've been fortunate with the people I've known, some of them quite famous orthodontists. And over time, I've collected a lot of information and I've really stitched it together to form my present views. Most of all, I think my father influenced me. He taught me from a very young age that there is a reason for everything. And that, I'm sure, has guided me through life. If ever I'm faced with a problem, I say to myself, there has to be an answer. And I'll then go on ferreting around until I find an answer. Sometimes this will take months, even years. But in the end, if you constantly think of all the possible answers, eventually you're likely to stumble on one which works. You can't say it is correct, but when you want to prove a theory is correct, the best way is to put the theory up and then see how it fits the evidence. That was taught to me by Karl Popper, the um, very famous philosopher who actually happened to live only about a quarter of a mile from where I am at the moment. Now, I was not a good student. Some people think I must be bright, but I was so stupid that I failed my basic um, dental exams four times. How could anyone be so stupid, you might think? But I had great ambitions and I wanted to be a specialist and I wanted to be a scientist. So I took my fellowship, which of course is the open door into the scientific world. Well, you might not believe it, but I failed that exam eight times. You might say, how could anyone be so stupid as to fail the same exam eight times? Well, in the end, I decided that perhaps I should um, make up my own ideas rather than trying to learn everybody else's ideas. But I got on much better with that. I was very lucky in my early career um, to go to a leading surgical unit. And that, I'm sure, gave me a good start in life. But um, over time, I met a lot of interesting people. My father, as I think I have told, said before, was very keen on expansion. He'd been taught this as a student. And yet, when I qualified, nobody expanded. However, because I was interested, I studied his results and found that, yes, expansion often relapses, which is why most orthodontists don't use it now, but often the relapse was only about halfway or even less. Sometimes there was no relapse. But what really changed my mind about the whole of orthodontic teaching was that sometimes after the expansion, the jaw would go on widening subsequently. Now, this blew my mind and was absolutely against everything i have been taught. But going on my father's advice, I thought there has to be a reason. And it was really working out that reason which set me off on an entirely different path. I created the so-called stage one bioblock appliance. This is an expansion appliance, which I created in the early 1970s. But I still think it is the best removable expansion appliance today. In fact, I think it's better than many of the fixed appliances. Um, but over time, I had a chance of meeting other people. 
Bob Moyers, who was probably the most famous orthodontist at the time, was interested in my stage one bioblock and he invited me to lecture about it at his famous symposium, which he gave in, in Ann Arbor, the university in Michigan, the United States. Now, that gave me a big leg up and he subsequently invited me back to talk about some of my other ideas. There, I was fortunate enough to meet Tom Graber, who in my mind, even today, was probably the most knowledgeable orthodontist I've ever met. Now, he um, was actually editor of the American Journal of Orthodontics, and he had lots of ideas of his own. But of course, as editor, he was not able to show his own ideas. Now, he never said so, but in retrospect, I think he made use of me so that I could put forward these rather unusual ideas, which he actually agreed with, but of course didn't appear to come from him. Over time, I met several other famous people, and probably the, the next most influential person I met was um, Egil Harvold. Now, that was back in 1958, a long, long time ago, and he had just completed doing some research on rhesus monkeys, testing their posture, particularly the tongue and lip posture. Now, interestingly, I had just worked out my own hypothesis, which I now call the tropic premise at that time. And I was actually upset because I said to myself, well, Harvard has uh, discovered my theory and nobody's going to listen to me. But in actual fact, nobody listened to Harvard either. And I know he died a disappointed man, but his work on monkeys showed without the slightest doubt that if you don't put your tongue on the palate, you will develop a malocclusion. Equally, if you keep your mouth open, he used to block the nose of these unfortunate monkeys, and they all developed very severe malocclusions. What amazed me was that the orthodontists of the time were really quite uninterested. They said, oh, monkeys are different from humans. They have a different neck. And um, I, really, I thought uh, they, they should have been more inspired. If so, I think orthodontics would be much more advanced than it is now. Anyway, um, I continued with the development of my own treatment, which essentially were very similar, but I was doing it with humans as distinct from um, monkeys. Um, and it was a few years later that I read a paper by Rolf Frankel. He was also a, a very, what we might call, lateral thinker. And he had developed an appliance which deliberately tried to change mouth posture, which of course was the same theory that I had. He used to put large flanges each side of the cheeks so that a child could not suck on their teeth when they swallowed. And it actually had quite a major effect on improving malocclusion. Unfortunately, the child could still leave their mouth open when wearing his appliance, and so I don't think it was as successful as it could have been. But I did learn a lot from Rob Frankel, and we became very good friends. He came and visited me in England later on, um, and uh, sadly again, he died a very frustrated death. I remember in his last article, he said orthodontists um, are just treating a symptom 
when they look at the crooked teeth. But they aren't treating the cause. Anyway, um, uh, I continued with my um, treatment. Gradually, a few people did start to listen, and I gave lectures all over the world. And I did actually meet one more significant um, uh, orthodontic character, um, um, Bieti Nelson, who trained actually in Aarhus, Denmark. She was a, a brilliant researcher and uh, I stayed with her and we had a lot of discussions on this and we really only differed on one point. She thought that most malocclusion was genetic, whereas I thought most malocclusion was environmental. But it was a big difference between us, but her research was fantastic and I made a lot of use of it, particularly the paper when she showed the people who keep their teeth together more have less malocclusion, something that many orthodontists um, miss today. I also, at that time, was working on the same idea, the amount of time that teeth should be in contact. And when um, a paper was published by Bill Prophet and Camilla Tullock, I thought I must go to South Carolina and meet them. So I did. And I spent some time with Bill in his laboratory where he was conducting this incredible research. He created a gadget, I will call it that, which fits into the mouth and could measure the eruptive force of each tooth. And his research was, to me, mind-blowing, but it actually answered the last question in my search for the truth, because he found that every tooth has its own eruption mechanism. When you wake up in the morning, your face is longer, and after each meal you have during the day, your face gets shorter. The, each individual tooth will sink down if subject to a lot of pressure or erupt up if not subject to pressure. Of course, this means that everybody's teeth should meet together when they open and close, whereas many of you will know but um, most people's teeth don't meet evenly. And this is considered to be one of the main causes of poor occlusion and indeed malocclusion and uh, temporomandibular joint problems, all of which are thought to be due to uneven tooth contacts. Well, according to the work of profit, it should not be possible to have uneven tooth contacts because every tooth should erupt into contact evenly. But of course, I realise that if people either leave their mouth open or even worse, put their tongue or maybe a pencil or a thumb between te their teeth, then the tooth eruption mechanism can't work. And I think that's a major factor in malocclusion. But all these ideas, as I say, have come from different people. I should mention Donald Enlow, who was one of my heroes in my youth, um, who I think most orthodontists would say um, described the natural growth of the jaws and teeth better than anyone else. Um, it was towards the end of his life, and I remember having a long chat with him, and rather delicately I suggested to him that his research really only demonstrated the growth of a small number of good-looking Americans that he used as subjects. Now, to my surprise, he agreed and said, yes, it doesn't really tell us anything about natural growth. And, um, of course, that is what we should really consider. Well, I think I've said enough. Um, it's a very complex subject.
But thanks to all those very famous people, I have been able to form an idea which I really believe gives the answer to malocclusion.